OK, we are at the top of the hour. It is 7 o'clock. Uh, so I would like to convene the May 24th, 2021 Dublin City Council meeting. Good evening and welcome. Uh, given the current pandemic conditions as allowed by the state legislature, uh, we continue to conduct our public meetings virtually to maintain the safety of council staff and residents. You can access the live stream on the city's website or on YouTube. In order to submit any questions or comments during the meeting, please use the form under the streaming video on the city's website. These questions and comments will be relayed to city council by our communications public information staff during the meeting. Uh, we certainly want to accommodate all public input uh, to the greatest extent possible. We welcome your comments on public business. We ask that you will refrain from inappropriate comments. I would like to add to that that I believe we will have one more virtual Dublin City Council meeting, uh, and then we will be all set to return to full in-person meetings. So uh, we, if you'll just endure one more of these after tonight with us, we will look forward to seeing uh, all of you in person and celebrating the opportunity to be together. With that, I see Homer has magically appeared on my screen and would ask that he lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Homer. Uh, okay, we have a few special presentations this evening, uh, and we're going to start with our future city Ohio region winners, uh, Evan and Reed Spellberg and Emily and Alex Carr. And uh, you know, this is near and dear to many city council folks' hearts, as we're you know, are all interested in the future of cities. Um, so we have a proclamation for you, and then ask if you would like to make some comments. Or um, is Evan and Reed and Emily and Alex, are you with us? Yes, we, we are here. Here. Hi. Yes. Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm going to read a proclamation and then we'll uh, give you a minute to say a few words if you'd like. So, proclamation reads as follows Whereas the Dublin Remote Learning Academy Future City Team vast exploration of the cosmos through orbital residency or a vector won first place in the Ohio region future city competition in February 2021. And whereas the team of Evan Spielberg, Emily Carr, Reed Spielberg, and Alex Carr met weekly, typically over Zoom, to learn about city planning and engineering concepts and brainstorm solutions on how a city of at least 100 years in the future would address the challenges of the 2021 theme, Living on the Moon, in order to provide a sustainable and enjoyable community for its residents. And whereas sponsored by Discover E, the Future City Competition is a project-based learning program where middle school students imagine, research, design, and build cities of the future. And whereas in addition to placing first in the state competition, Vector was recognized for best infrastructure by the American Society of Civil Engineers, best use of ceramics by Allied Mineral Products, Best use of energy by Commonwealth Associates. Best use of recreation by Worthington AM Rotary Club. Most environmentally friendly by IBI Group. Best land surveying practices by National Council of Examiners for Engineers and Surveyors. And best city ass essay for the Ohio region. And whereas the Vector team completed competed in April of 2021 at the National, National Future City Competition against 42 teams where it won a special award, Mission Possible, possi positively impacting the community from the National Society of Black Engineers. And whereas the students who attend Dublin City Schools were mentioned by their, were mentored by their mothers, Mindy Carr, an environmental engineer, and Elaine Spielberg, who served as a parent mentor. Now, therefore, I, Chris Amrose Groom, Mayor of the City of Dublin, Ohio, in behalf on, of all of Dublin City Council, do hereby congratulate Team Vector for its creativity and ingenuity in bringing this recognition to themselves, 
their schools and our community. So welcome, four of you. So nice to have you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank so you. Tell, tell us in, in a minute or two um, about how you navigated this process and some of the things you learned. Um, the Future City competition allowed us to combine art and engineering, and it also required communication skills to describe the city in an essay. And for our virtual submission, it also incorporated video production, which was very fun. And the combination of multiple areas of interest created an outlet through which all of the team members excelled. So it was very fun to be a part of the team in which everybody was being able to put their best self forward. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Spielberg, do you have anything to add? Yeah, we were able to express our creativity outside of school and recognize the abilities of our team members and friends. And being a part of the Future City competition was an excellent opportunity to collaborate with our friends on a project that we would normally not be able to work on together, especially during the pandemic and with the added barrier of being an online school and we enjoyed seeing our friends on a regular basis. Yes, in addition, we also learned valuable time management skills, you know, early on, and this really helped us, especially when sticking to a project plan in order to get things done by a certain deadline. And we also, we also, our favorite part was um, building our model because we got to look at our materials creatively and in a new way in order to be able to, um, find materials that would fit as buildings on the moon and such. And so we also use the engineering design process to help us build our models. And that was really fun for us. Well, it sounds like you guys spent your, uh, your COVID time well. You did not waste a minute of it and you learned some really valuable life skills. Um, so we're really hopeful that uh, we can stay in touch with you. We have, um, we have our, your vision is and for a hundred years, you. Your vision is much longer than ours. We're, we're in the midst of doing a 2035 framework plan and you're kind of making me feel bad. Like we're not we're not looking long enough, but uh, <laughs> um, really hope that we can engage you in that at some point and uh, that you can and help us think about what 2035 just here on Earth would be like, because if you could figure it out on the moon, this Earth stuff's going to be a piece of cake for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being with us tonight. Yes. Thank you for having us. And uh, you're welcome to stay for this very entertaining Dublin City Council meeting, uh, but you might you might have some homework to do. You do have a few days left of school before summer break. So uh, any, <laughs> anything else? Uh, no, I think we're all good. Uh, Mayor, Mike was allowed and I just uh, have, uh, before the, the kids uh, head out, I just wanted to say that your, your wish may be true, uh, closer than you may realize because um, I coordinate the future city competition uh, for the state of Ohio with a with a group of team members. I um, I'm actually on the cusp of Dublin and Hilliard. I, my post office is Dublin. My uh, my my taxes go to Hilliard. But uh, uh, the, it's okay. We still like you. Pardon? That's okay. We still like you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we um, but I was about to just share that uh, they did a phenomenal job. I mean, it was uh, under very difficult circumstances. Typically. Um, you know, the, the, these young people, they meet after school in person, they have a teacher and a guide right there and uh, to help them work through that. And, and what they've accomplished this year is, is quite simply amazing. We started off with 23 schools across Ohio, 27 actually, and only six of them made it to the finals. And then as you read out the awards that not only did RLA win first prize for the state of Ohio, but they also swept a whole number of uh, special award. So that was all great. And I was saying your wish may be maybe closer than you realize because we're already working on next year's competition. And the theme this time is going to be a zero waste city. So you you can hold them to their word now and say, get them working right now. Um, check your labor laws, but uh, get them working on a zero waste city for, for the 2022 competition that's already out there. And we're already doing the planning. So thank you all for taking the time to recognize these young people. I think they're they're quite amazing. When I was their age, uh, all I cared about was soccer and um, girls. Uh, but I think here they are doing, doing fantastic work. So I appreciate the recognition for them and for the city of Dublin as well. Thank you, Mr. We appreciate folks like you working with them. And we do have, as, uh, you know, we do are working towards looking at zero waste events here in the city. So maybe the events people might be some of the first to reach out to you. 
uh, and, and see how we might be able to do a zero waste Irish festival and, and things of that nature. So um, lots of work to do and, and thanks for your leadership and the project and kiddos. We are so proud of you and your community is uh, is grateful for your hard work in this difficult time. So thanks for being with us and have a great evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mary Grooms. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See y'all. Okay, uh, and we have another proclamation here that we get to celebrate tonight. It's always nice when you get to celebrate things at the beginning of a meeting. Um, so the, this is going to be a, a proclamation um, that is my agenda here before me, right? Uh, this is going to be for Courtney Porter. Courtney, are you with us this evening for a COSI STEM star? Look at you working hard. Thank you for that. Well, Courtney, I'm going to uh, do the same with you. I'm going to read this proclamation. I don't want to make you take off your mask and hopefully you're somewhere where that's OK. Don't break any rules here, um, but I'm going to read this proclamation and, and uh, we might have a few questions for you in a moment to, to share your thoughts. So uh, the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas Courtney Porter, the RN clinical leader at Nationwide Children's Hospital close to home urgent care center in Dublin is a 2021 COSI STEM star, star and represented the city of Dublin at the third annual COSI Science Festival which took place May 5th through the 8th, 2021. And whereas the COSI STEM Star Award receives individual, recognizes individuals who champion science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And whereas throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Courtney has been Dublin Urgent Care's resource in keeping staff up to date on proper personal protective equipment. I just saw her wearing all of hers. Infection control and equipment cleaning protocols and in maintaining the facility's safe environment for staff and patients. And whereas one of our valued frontline workers, she was selected for her unwavering dedication to her patients during the pandemic and for demonstrating on a daily basis her passion for science that helps save lives. And whereas a registered nurse and certified pediatric nurse, Courtney is a graduate of The Ohio State University and holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in nursing. And whereas Courtney, a graduate of Dublin Kaufman High School, lives in the Dublin community with her husband and two children. And whereas she has worked in the emergency department, pediatric surgery clinic, and the urgent care network during her 17 year nursing career, which began in 2004 at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Now, therefore, I, Chris Amrose, Grooms, Mayor of the City of Dublin, Ohio, do hereby congratulate Courtney Porter on behalf of all of Dublin City Council as the City of Dublin's 2021 COSI STEM star in recognition of her hands on application of science in improving people's health and well being, signed this 24th day of May 2021. So, Courtney, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. That was a mouthful. So, tell us a little bit about what you did. Uh, well, I am the RN clinical leader for the Nationwide Children's Hospital Dublin Urgent Care. Uh, those of you with kids may have seen me before. I may have even taken care of your kids at some point. So uh, happy to see you, not happy to see you all at the same time, of course. But um, yeah, we we have definitely done our best to make sure that we are keeping up to date with all of the, the latest news regarding COVID and just doing our best to keep our patients as well as our staff and families safe during all of this. Well, you know, we cannot thank. Well, we, we appreciate all you've done for the COSI STEM star and um, for the science festivals. Those are really uh, important and meaningful activities for the youth all over uh, our region, truthfully. Um, but we really thank you for your work that you've done in the medical profession and being a nurse and uh, looking out for our community and the youngest and some of the most vulnerable and um, really appreciate all that you've done. So. Thanks for being with us tonight. We'll get you this proclamation. We'll get one delivered to you. And we're really proud of you and really glad that you called up and home. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I sort of feel like this COSA STEM award should probably go to those future city kids because I think really they're, they're some superstars. I'm so impressed by all of them. It's our future leaders right there. So it's, it's fantastic. But, but thank you very much. We really appreciate the support of the Dublin community um, here at the Urgent Care. And, and um, so it's, it's been a tough year for healthcare workers, as I'm sure you guys all know. But um, we really appreciate just having the support of this wonderful community. So thank you all very much. 
Well, you've got that in abundance and thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Looks like you have a lot of work ahead of you. I do. Thank you so much. Yep. See ya. Okay, uh, up next, we are going to talk a little bit about Memorial Day services and I believe Jeff Noble is with us here this evening. All right. Oh, there he is. Hello, Jeff. How are you? Good. How are you, Mayor? Thanks for being with us tonight. Sure. Um, and I understand maybe you might have some uh, some information for us regarding how Memorial Day services will be held and all of the wonderful events that y'all are putting on and how we can participate and or be a part of those things and, and um, what the Dublin community should expect. Well, of course, the current health rules prevent a public ceremony, I guess. Uh, however, the veterans of uh, Lance Corporal Wesley G. Davids Post 800 of the American Legion will celebrate the traditional Memorial Day. We'll have a re-ceremony on the bridge, march to the cemetery, and we'll have a small ceremony in the cemetery with a speaker. Um, couldn't get a band this year, but we've got buglers and maybe a bagpiper. Um, there, we did prepare a special video uh, that will be posted to uh, DublinVeterans.com on, on uh, Memorial Day. Um, interviews with some kids. Uh, uh, your councilman Reiner and I uh, yakking it up. Um, you know, Memorial Day is is a very special day, and I just hope we get through this phase and can do it the way it, it really should be done. Um, we invite people to participate in the afternoon moment of silence at three o'clock. Um, the Abbey Theater is doing, and this is new to me, but the Abbey Theater is doing a uh, producing a virtual adaption of former President Garfield's uh, Decoration Day speech. Uh, and that really sounds kind of interesting. And then this weekend, we will also share uh, details uh, of your Leadership Dublin group that worked on a project to tell uh, deceased veteran stories. So essentially using your database on the cemetery, eventually we hope that somebody can walk into the cemetery, find a, uh, using the database, find a veteran's grave and hear the story of what he did and where he did it and how he did it. Uh, ain't technology great. Uh, the other thing is on Saturday, we will decorate the, the cemetery as we usually do and the uh, grounds of remembrance also. So if anybody wants to come out and plant flags, uh, we have a couple of scout groups joining us. Uh, so they're starting to loosen up a little bit and we hope it goes well. Well, Jeff, we really, um, really appreciate all that. Um all of the veterans do to, to honor this day. It certainly is a very special day and it is, I think it breaks all of our hearts that we don't have the opportunity to celebrate it together. I know that is one, always one of the days that I treasure. So um, hopefully the, the end is near in terms of our COVID protocols and we will be able to be together sooner rather than later. Um, I did. I did hear the uh, leadership Dublin graduation projects, and that project was really outstanding about using the QR codes and uh, having each individual veteran story be available. I think that would be something extremely special for our community. We believe that they intend to continue that project and see it to fruition. So, I know that you all were a uh, great help to them and we certainly do appreciate that and I'm sure you will continue to be. But uh, yeah, we will, I believe, be pushing out the, um, these some of these videos and the uh, moments of silence and things on our 
communication channels so that the community will know about it. Uh, and we'll go ahead and talk with them a little bit about uh, circulating the information about flags on Saturday and see what might be able to be relative to that as well. So uh, anything else for us, sir? No, ma'am. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, can't wait to see you again. All right. Thanks. Thank you. See ya. Take care, man. Okay. Have a great Bye. evening. Bye. Okay. <clears throat> um, next up, we have uh, Scott Dring is here with us this evening, and he is going to be giving us an update on uh, the Dublin. So, Scott, are you here? He is. Well, welcome, Hello. Scott. Thanks. Great to see you, Mary. Great to see everyone. I appreciate a couple minutes. I'm going to be really brief. I know you guys have a stacked agenda today um, and share actually some good news for once, right? I mean, it's been every time I come on, you know, I'm like the, the Grim Reaper the last 15 months or so, but um, I think we have some good news to share with you. Um, to start off, I think it, the important thing is that we've seen that 89% of Americans plan to travel in the next six months. And that's not only the highest number we've seen during the pandemic, but it's the highest number we've ever seen um, since the, the national organization has been doing this. So it just means there's a lot of pent up demand out there uh, to travel. I can tell you our hotels um, for every sector of our industry, not just hotels, but the number one challenge right now is finding employees. Uh, we're doing what we can to help. In fact, we're launching an awareness campaign this week uh, promoting the benefits of working in the hospitality industry and ultimately helping fill those jobs. Uh, we'll be collaborating with the Dublin Chamber um, on that effort that will again will launch this week. As you know, uh, bed tax is an important revenue source for the city. We're projecting for the second half of 2021, that's July through December, that Dublin bed tax will increase 80% over the same period last year. Um, so although that increase is positive, uh, that projection is still 38% below where we were the same period in 2019. Uh, we don't expect to reach pre-COVID bed tax levels until 2024. Uh, the major reason being the corporate business will be the last to rebound, and that is the majority of our business uh, here in the city of Dublin. 79% uh, of our restaurants are posting improved sales in May over April. Uh, the lifting of health orders, changing Ohio unemployment, outdoor dining, have all been a huge boost for our restaurants and the local economy. Uh, thanks again to Dana and all of you for supporting the outdoor dining initiative during the pandemic. It was truly a lifeline uh, for a lot of our restaurants. Uh, our retail sector underwent a massive change as consumers were confined to their homes and unable to shop in person. Um, our niche shops, you know, especially here in downtown Dublin, have fared pretty well, uh, but it'll still be an uphill battle um, in the future. Um, for the first half of this year of 2021, Council was gracious enough to provide Visit Dublin some gap funding of $174,000 for sales and marketing efforts. And I wanted to kind of highlight a few of those results for that investment that you provide us. Uh, we generated more than 51 million media impressions showcasing the city of Dublin, national publications such as Forbes, Midwest Living, several television features in Cleveland and Cincinnati, over 200,000 website visits, 20 new business leads, all exceeding our goals. Uh, our weekend business is up, and I think that's the main reason we've been able to kind of weather the storm the last few months as well. Uh, our leisure campaigns promoting Dublin as a weekend destination have generated great results. As we market Dublin, not only throughout the state of Ohio, but in Pittsburgh, Indy, Detroit, and all markets within a three hour drive. Uh, the Celtic Cocktail Trail is now digital and touchless. Uh, we've had more than 1,500 people uh, participate in that since March. We've had over 6,000 participate in the Ferry Door Trail as well. Um, I know these uh, trails seem a little gimmicky at times, but they truly generate dollars for our local businesses. Uh, for example, to participate in the Cocktail Trail, uh, which includes 18 Dublin businesses, you need to make a purchase and most offer discounts on, on food as well. Uh, we continue to lead the Downtown Dublin Strategic Alliance, and thank you for Dora. Um, we had a great start this past weekend. Initial feedback is, is showing record numbers in business and economic impact to the city. 
I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the North Market experience is busy, busiest Thursday through Saturday since opening. Uh, Cameron Mitchell restaurants saw double digit percentage increases. Uh, Coast Wine House, which obviously is the far south end, um, saw an increase in business. And Ron Jordan, who's one of our board members and owner and headquarters, said Dora was a huge impact. Uh, they set records over the weekend and really wanted me to make sure that, that I thank council on behalf of all the restaurants for Dora and all the outdoor dining initiatives that you did. Um, the last bullet point there, um, you know, most of our partners, the majority of our partners are hotels, restaurants, events, and retail. Um, I think you agree no industry was harder hit in the pandemic than ours. And I think it says a lot that 98% of our partners renewed their financial partnership to visit Dublin in the middle of the pandemic, reinforcing that we're doing what is essential for their providing, uh, for their survival. And we actually had 17 new partners as well this year. And I hope it's just another confirmation that your investment is being well spent. So where do we go for the rest of 2021? Uh, our leisure market, we're launching a statewide and regional campaign promoting the city during the summer and fall. This will be mostly a digital campaign, um, which will reach those within a three hour drive of Dublin. We continue to pitch Dublin as a destination to the sports organizers in hopes of attracting their event to the city. We're also growing current sports business, uh, such as the Buckeye Archery Classic, which will be held this summer. Uh, it's actually the fourth time it will be held here in the city, and they've actually announced that they'll be coming back next year as well. Bus tours, we're creating new experiences to track those tours um, here to Dublin. Uh, this market has been bouncing back a lot quicker than we had expected. In fact, we've already hosted several buses from Illinois, New Jersey, New Hampshire, and others. Uh, these buses typically hold 50 or so visitors. And they dump a lot of money in our hotels, restaurants, and retail. Locally, we'll be bringing back the popular picnic packs uh, program promoting takeout and outdoor dining experiences. We have a website, incentives that will promote uh, heavily across central Ohio. Um, corporate business travel is still slow. Uh, as we predicted, this segment will be the last to rebound. And we're concerned that the work at home may have a permanent impact. We'll, we'll keep looking at that in and working with Cardinal and, and our other corporate partners to track that. Uh, the good news is that we're, we're attending several trade shows this fall um, that will meet with regional and national meeting planners to promote Dublin. These shows are a critical tactic for us to, to track business and were canceled uh, during the pandemic. Um, kind of to, to, to finish up, um, I, I can tell you that we continue to execute several DEI initiatives uh, such as diverse representation on our board using diverse influencers and vendors and our board president dr david lee um, is leading a dei committee with a focus on what we can do as an organization what we can do to lead dublin's hospitality industry as well um, we're working with homer to have our staff use the city training with steve francis and we actually just met with homer and kirby last week to make sure we're complementing each other's efforts and we're aligned in the future so again thank you for your leadership on this important effort. Um, new board members quickly, again, I mentioned Ron Jordan, owner of Penn Quarter, Rick Harrison Wolf, who's the executive director at the North Market, and Sharon Baker McGee is, your, is our new city council representative, uh, replacing Frank Wilson, who, who did a fantastic job over his six year term as well. And Betty Clark is your other um, city council rep. So again, thank you for all you're doing for our industry, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Scott. I sure do appreciate the update. Any questions from Council? Hey, Scott, is uh, River Boxes, you know, that's one of the nice sure. tourist things that you've done such a good job with, with uh, the ferry doors and the uh, Celtic cocktail trail. And another fun thing to do when you get here is the River Boxes. Um, are, are you guys working that out with the Arts Council or how's that all being handled? Absolutely, the, you know, we're using their assets all the time I mean, not only river boxes, but all the art and public places. They're doing, you know, they've done a tremendous job during this pandemic uh, of creating some new product as well. We're going to announce, I won't spoil it now, but in the next week or so, you're going to hear about a new campaign that we're working with them collaboratively locally celebrating uh, local heroes. So, yeah, it's a, it's a hand in hand uh, collaboration for sure. John. You know, another cool thing that you know we were discussing a number of weeks ago was the um, uh, different bicycle trails, the ice cream bicycle trail, the historic bicycle trail, the art uh, trail, and possibly even the fishing trail. So I don't know how far you guys got into the weeds with that, but that sounded like a really fun 
thing to draw people down here to do different kind of things. So uh, I don't know how that's coming along. You know, we just heard about it maybe a month or so ago. Uh, have you got any uh, reflections on that or what's going on? We have, I mean, we've had several meetings with, with uh, the city staff on that. I think we actually have one tomorrow morning. The new Emerald Trail that, that the city launched a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, it, what, that connects everything, the connectivity is, is a great message for us. So, so yeah, we're on top of that for sure. It's another great, any, any product we can have to sell. I know um, Councilwoman Fox gave us a lead several months ago about birding and, and it being an attraction. So we're working with the bird expert at the, at the city staff to, <laughs> To even help promote that and get people uh, down here to enjoy that as well. Great. Thank you. Thanks for everything you're doing, Scott. Okay, anything else? I'll sure do appreciate the update, Scott. Have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you. Up. Okay, uh, this brings us to the citizen comments portion of our agenda. This is an op opportunity for citizens to comment on any topic that is not on this evening's agenda. Lindsay, have we had anyone who wishes to make comment? Good evening, Mayor. We have not had any comments at this time. Thank you. Okay, our consent agenda, is there a request to remove anything from the, this evening's con consent agenda? Uh, hearing none, uh, I will make a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the four items listed. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Yes. Okay, that brings us to second reading public hearing ordinances, Ordinance 21 21. Maintaining the existing ward boundaries of the city of Dublin as required by Article 9.04 of the revised charter. Thank you, Homer. Do you have a staff report for us this evening? Uh, yes, members of council, good evening. Um, there are no changes from the first reading. Uh, staff recommends, a, subject to your question, staff recommends approval of this ordinance. Thank you. Lindsay, uh, do we have any public comments relative to this legislation? We do not. Uh, council questions, discussion? Hearing none, this is ju just as a reminder, we will revisit this once the um, census data is available and we have solid numbers in which to um, change, make any adjustments as necessary to the boundaries, board boundaries in the city. So uh, that being said, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Ms. Fox? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Thanks, Homer. Uh, okay, Ordinance 23-21. Adopting the proposed tax budget for fiscal year 2022. Miller Jason. Thank you. And uh, Matt Stifter will present for us. So welcome, Matt. Yes, thank yes, you, Mayor. Sir. Good evening, members of council. Before you tonight is Ordinance 22-21, which contains the 2022 tax budget. This budget is uh, required to be adoptive, effective, and provided to the county auditor no later than July 20th. Having its first hearing tonight with a second uh, hearing scheduled for your next meeting will allow the city to comply with this timeline. Uh, filing this information with the county auditor is a requirement for the city to be eligible to receive our share of local government funds. And in 2020, the city received $433,000 in local government funds. Staff recommends adoption of this ordinance at the second hearing on June 14th. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. Lindsay, have we received any public comment relative to this legislation? We have not. Council questions, discussion. Uh, hearing none, we will look forward to seeing you back on June the 14th for second reading. Thank you, Matt. Ordinance 23-21. 
Amendments to Zoning Code Section 153.022 Definitions and Section 153.026 Suburban Office District to add a new land use classification for specialty hospitals to the Suburban Office District. I'll introduce it. Tammy Noble is going to have our staff presentation. She's ready for us as we speak. Welcome, Thank Tammy. you so much. And you can see my presentation, correct? Yes, ma'am. So this legislation is um, introducing a new land use classification for specialty hospitals. Um, the city had talked to the Planning and Zoning Commission as well as council members. And with the dynamics of the medical industry decided that there should be a land use classification that's specific to specialty hospitals. So currently specialty hospitals are listed under hospitals, which are permitted in suburban office and several of our bridge street districts. Um, this is a general land use classification that allows for more um, intensive medical uses. And again, uh, prompts the question of the current proposal for something that's more specific to smaller operations. Um, we've re re reviewed several of the applications that not only went to the Planning and Zoning Commission, but as well as uh, inquiries that went to uh, general staff um, and dissected what the operational needs of these specific uses are <clears throat> and thus uh, determined a definition and uh, conditions for this particular use. So just a general overview, um, this was, was originally introduced to the Planning and Zoning Commission in October. We went to the Planning and Zoning Commission with specific code language in both February and March and reviewed not only the definition of uh, specialty hospitals, but specifically um, land use uh, standards for, the, for this use. And we have uh, finalized a recommendation in April 2021. The current definition you will see on your screen is a care facility that's focused on one or more concentrated areas of medical care with overnight care of patients. Um, I, I won't go through the particulars of the uh, definition, but specifically we're recommending that specialty household hospitals be proposed as a conditional use specifically in the suburban office district um, with the following recommendations. Um, that the site be located on a minimum of three acres in size, that the facilities be uh, required a density of 9,500 square feet per acre with a maximum of 50,000 square feet, that the facility be located within a minimum of 500 square feet or excuse me, feet from uh, residential uses, that any type of outdoor spaces be located to the side or rear of the facility, um, that lighting standards meet the Dublin city code, and that there be an emergency and security plan uh, permitted by staff, and a parking plan, again, uh, permitted by city staff. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of the proposed amendments, and we are requesting uh, respectfully uh, approval by City Council on the second hearing of June 14, 2021. Great. Thank you, Tammy. I want to check in with Lindsay. Have we received any public comment relative to this legislation? We have not. Appreciate that. Uh, Council questions, discussion? Um, yeah, Tammy, I think that um, in the code, if I'm not correct, I think we removed the fence requirement. Um, it was in your presentation, but I think that was removed. So I, I wanted to verify, just clarify that. Um, I wanted to mention to council that um, uh, first and foremost, to, to really thank staff for all the work that they put into this specialty hospital code. Um, definition and the restrictions um, in the parameters, as well as the fact that legal had um, quite a bit of input on this. But planning and zoning looked at this with a fine tooth comb to make sure that that um, the correct kinds of code 
uh, um, language would provide the very best kind of specialty hospital use for the residences. And one thing that I would just point out is that um, there is a 500 foot setback from any residential. And I think that's a really important point to notice. Um, these specialty hospitals are gonna become more and more um, common within communities to get healthcare closer to within a community instead of to go far. And I think that this is a prime opportunity for us to to be able to give parameters that are healthy, not only for the hospitals to serve these patients, but also healthy for a community and their placement. Uh, minimum three acres, uh, maximum square footage, maximum per acreage, um, good buffering from residential, asking for an emergency and a perimeter security plan when it's necessary to address operational needs, which gives flexibility. And, um, uh, and a 50% building coverage of lots. So I think that this will give us in the future a really nice um, opportunity to bring the right kind of um, hospital care, especially hospital care into the community. So thank you planning and thank you legal for all the work you've done on this. Any other comments from council? Yeah, Kathy. I just had a quick question just for uh, clarification, not for necessarily uh, questioning, but um, the size dimensions and the footprint dimensions, how did the group arrive at that size? Is there is there sort of a standard of what these would look like? I'm just interested in in this, the size and scope requirement. Thank you. No, that's an excellent question. We actually uh, reviewed some of our uh, current operations, as well as our um, some requests that we've we had gotten in, and we just determined that there seems to be this uh, gap, and 50,000 square feet seems to be the smaller of the operations, and it, it rises significantly to 100,000 square feet. So we um, use that as a, a gate point for um, minimizing the smaller operations. So if someone wanted to come in with something that was slightly bigger, um, how would that work? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, these are use specific standards, so they, they're required to be met to be permitted. Um, I don't know if legal wants to weigh in. I'm not exactly certain that you could do a variance to use specific standards, um, but they're, they're meant to contain a use um, under those parameters. And Tammy, we're, we're, I'm quite happy to, you know, get clarification for the next meeting if that's easier, but it, it was just interesting sure, to sure. me to understand a little bit about the size dimension and I see Jennifer's on. So yeah, I, I think those use specific standards are meant to be um, like more hard and fast rules. And so that portion of it, I think we would, would be restricted. And if they wanted to do something else, they could always come in as a PUD um, and get something that's tailored to that specific use. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Any other questions for staff? Tammy, I just have one. You had mentioned about fencing and one of the consistent themes across all of these is normally the fence that they request is significantly higher than our code permits. and. Uh, if in fact we did remove the fencing requirement, what how will handle the typical need for an increased height in the fence? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, that was actually a point of significant conversation, and essentially, the Planning and Zoning Commission didn't want to encourage number one the requirement that there is a fence because that's originally where we started. And number two, that it would um, increase in any type of way, shape, or form from our current code. So at this point, um, when it went, if any requests were to go forward, that would have to be a specific um, request. And again, we're not, we're simply not trying to encourage fencing as a requirement. It, it doesn't necessarily um, accommodate the use, it is in certain instances a requirement, but we're, again, we're not trying to encourage fences as a requirement. Okay, 
Thank you. Jane, did you have something else? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I think the reason that we put in the emergency and perimeter security plan was to address any operational needs. Therefore, if a fence was, if the, if planning and zoning felt that a fence was required, then that could be something that they would demand in the perimeter security plan. So, instead of requiring a fence in every instance, we left that to the planning and zoning to, um, to look at a perimeter security plan to see if it's something that they would recommend. So, we hope we covered it on that aspect. Is that right, Tammy? Correct me if I'm wrong. No, yeah, absolutely. I wanted to thank you for that comment. That's perfect. Okay, other comments? Okay, well, we will look forward to a second hearing on June 14th. Okay, this brings Thank us you. to introduction. Sorry? Sorry? I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Okay, introduction public hearing vote resolutions, resolution 28 21. Acceptance of historic design guidelines, replacing the historic Dublin design guidelines applicable to historic Dublin and outlying historic properties identified in Appendix G. All right, is that? Thank you. And uh, Nikki Martin, there she is. Welcome, Nikki. We have our, our staff report for us this evening. Yes, good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Um, as mentioned, this is a request for acceptance of a resolution for new historic design guidelines. This project is many years in the making and is the result of um, stakeholder engagement, uh, public community engagement, as well as several years of board and commission review. The guidelines are uh, comprised of two parts. Part one is a general overview, which sets the stage for recommendations provided in the second part, uh, which are chapters four through seven and are the substantive guidelines. These guidelines are recommended for acceptance in conjunction with the recently approved architectural review district uh, zoning code amendments and area rezoning that were considered by council in February of 2021. So in detail, the overview provides uh, context and character of Historic Dublin. This was a primary focus of both the Architectural Review Board as well as the Planning and Zoning Commission, ensuring we were accurately capturing um, the cultural landscape as well as the architectural styles of our community. And it also provides guidance on how to use those guidelines for new board members, as well as uh, members of the community. There are four chapters dedicated to guidance on how to implement the requirements of the code. These include specific guidance on rehabilitation of existing structures and modification to existing structures, along with graphics, new construction, and how to sensitively address the surrounding context, as well as to prioritize preservation within historic Dublin. And finally, site design and signs. Staff, um, as well as the Architectural Review Board and the Planning and Zoning Commission are recommending acceptance to City Council this evening. With that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Lindsay, I want to check in and see if we've received any public comment relative to this legislation. We have not. Uh, council questions, discussion? Uh, yeah, I would just say, uh, Nikki, Jenny, all the ARB members, uh, kudos. What, three, four years in the making? Uh, very, very comprehensive and thorough. Uh, very well done. And um, I'm glad to see we're finally getting this thing put to bed. Thank you. Any others? Yeah, Chris, I, I also want to thank the staff. This was a, a yeoman's job. And for anybody that's listening in the public, I think a couple of things that I'd like to point out that were added to this that maybe give some confidence to maintaining the preservation of the character of the historic district. Um, 
the way this guideline uh, work was set out, it started out one with the history so that one understands what, um, you know, the past of Dublin was like and, and how the historic district developed. But most importantly, it's, it is a very clearly explained uh, objectives of what it means to conserve and maintain and preserve the historic district in its um, context and character. If you don't read anything else, read the context and character part of it. Because what this does is it adds not only um, an understanding of how the guidelines are supposed to work, but it reassures those who live and love the historic district that it's the preservation of character. It's the preservation of the ambience. It's that abstract sense when you walk through the district that we're, not tr that we're trying to preserve. Because in those three points, the building and architecture is third. The first is um, the cultural landscape, which 60% of our district is what I call cultural landscape. It's the topography, it's the riverfront, it's the stone walls, it's the cemetery, it's the Indian Run Ravine. All of that is protected in these guidelines and brought out. And secondly, it's neighborhood character. It's what everybody enjoys when they walk down the street. So. If you read that piece, or if anyone who cares about the district is wondering whether or not we protected it, all I can do is give the staff a high five and ARB and all, all the people that worked on it a high five because you have absolutely guided the future of every architecture review board on what it means to protect the district. So I just think it's wonderful and the code covers everything else that you were worried about, lot coverage, building footprint, height, and all of that. So this is a complete and a wonderful package, and I just give everyone great kudos for the work that they've done. So thank you, Nikki, and everybody on staff. Thank, thank you. you. Any other thoughts? I think this was the next lo next logical step after redefining the area of the district, um, you know, to to nail down this this next set of uh, of protection and consideration. Um, and certainly will hopefully make the ARB's job easier now that they have a defined district that actually contains historical buildings and, and not have to um, continue that fight time and time again. So, uh, okay. Uh, that being said, uh, Jenny, would you please hold roll? Mr. Keeler? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Yeah. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Okay, uh, resolution 29-21. Accepting the lowest and best bid for the 2021 annual guard rail replacement and maintenance program. I already said. Thank you. And our staff report is going to be Paul. Welcome, Paul. Hey, good evening, members of council. On May 6, 2021, one bid was received, publicly opened, and read by engineering staff for the 2021 Guardrail Replacement and Maintenance Program. This project involves repairing and replacing several specialized areas of guardrail, specifically the replacement of the wood guardrail with painted galvanized steel guardrail on the Bristol Parkway Bridge over the North Fork Indian Run, and the removal of 20 feet of bridge parapet on the southeast end of the Bridge Street Bridge over the Sauter River and replacing it with steel back timber guardrail. All work is located within the existing road right away. In terms of traffic effects of the project, Bristol Parkway will remain open to traffic for the duration of the construction. On the east end of the Bridge Street Bridge over the Sauter River, the dedicated right turn lane may be closed for up to eight consecutive days during the construction. The outside eastbound through lane may also be closed to traffic as needed but for shorter periods during the performance of the work. Both westbound lanes on Bridge Street will remain open to traffic at all times. The engineer's estimate for this work is $170,000. The budgeted funds in the 2021 CIP for annual guardrail replacement and maintenance are $190,000. Paul Peterson Company Incorporated submitted the lowest and best bid of $186,997. The bid received is greater than the engineer's estimate and likely reflects the result of recent cost increases in guardrail material and costs related to the specialized work. Construction is to commence in late summer and the completion date is November 20th of this year. 
The typical and customary com communication methods will be used to convey construction information to residents and motorists throughout the duration of the project. Staff has thoroughly reviewed the Paul Peterson Company bid. Previous experience with Paul Peterson has been excellent on past guardrail replacement and maintenance programs, and staff is confident they will perform well on this project. Staff recommends Council approval of Resolution 29-21, accepting as lowest and best the bid of Paul Peterson Company Incorporated in the amount of $186,997 and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Paul Peterson Company Incorporated for this program. Be glad to answer any questions council might have about this resolution. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, Lindsay, do we have any comments from the public? Nothing to report. Mm -hmm. uh, council questions, discussion. Yeah, Jane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have a question, Paul. What could you describe what the bridge parapet replaced? What's the bridge parapet on the east end of the bridge? Is it? Is it part of the old stone work? Is it? I, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm not an engineer. <laughs> no, that's a great question. And, um, and you don't need to be an engineer to understand this. If you look at the southeast corner of that bridge, there's a concrete parapet wall. It looks like a, the kind of the standard Jersey barrier wall. Um, at the very end of the bridge, as you make that dedicated right turn lane, um, going into the roundabout, going east to head south, and it basically runs pretty parallel to the curb and there's been several contacts of vehicles with that parapet wall. Um, we underestimated during the design of that roundabout kind of its location and the impact it might have. So we're just gonna trim off 20 feet of that and replace it with timberback uh, steel guardrail just to minimize that contact point and move it away from the traveled roadway. Okay, so my, my main concern is aesthetics on that east end because we probably didn't realize when we were doing the little scenic underpass that we were going to get stuck with something that looked like that right so this is a better aesthetic is what you're saying it's going to give us a much better look on that end of the bridge yeah it's the timber guardrail is what we've used you know elsewhere throughout dublin so yeah instead of just seeing the plain concrete wall that's essentially right. three to four feet tall you'll see the the, the pain painted or stained uh timber guardrail so right. we think Aesthetically, it'll look better aside okay. from being more functional and, and that was part of the consideration during the design process is how could we improve the appearance of this? Yeah, I think that's really important since it's an entryway and that and that leads to the 2nd question. <coughs> when do you decide when to use the steel backed timber guardrail? Because you're replacing a wood guardrail with a painted galvanized steel one on Bristol Parkway and I'm sure in that neighborhood they would prefer the timber again. So can you tell me when you choose to do which and what? Yeah, absolutely. It's a design consideration based on the location and also current standards. The difficulty with the timber rail is, is the depth of the rail and the weight of the rail itself and just functionally trying to get it installed and to work into some uh, locations is very difficult and, and many times just can't be accomplished. Uh, one of the difficulties with the timber back guard rail is it's very thick from front of the rail to the back of the post. So sometimes we can't get the appropriate offset from the travel to roadway to make it function. Whereas the steel guardrail is, is somewhat thinner. Um, so um, we always look at the timber guardrail first. That's always our first option on many of our roadways where we can't get that to work. Then we fall back to the painted or powder coated steel guardrail. Okay. And those are your really only two good options, aren't they? Those they really are. Yes. All right, just thought I'd ask for the community neighborhood because oh. I know they would have preferred it. But. Great question. Okay. So I wish okay. that would have been public works week, which was last week, but you know, we'll take it this week. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Any other questions from council? I know that East Abutment has been kind of something we we've had our eye on since that uh since that roundabout opened. So that's true. Thanks for bringing that to fruition. Uh, we only had one bidder on this project, and I, I think I was looking for the previous uh, guardrail replacement maintenance programs, and it seemed as though we had three on most. Any other deal, idea why the uh, other two didn't submit business on this occasion? Uh, we, we asked that question of ourselves. Um, one, probably the volume of work that's actually out there. There were several large state guardrail projects that bid. Um, in our experience, there's been three different guardrail contractors that have bid on our program. All have done great work, but they have a limited capacity. 
and probably number two, just a specialized work and then the size of this program probably didn't compete as well with some some of the other larger work that's out there. Um, and probably given their capacity, they felt that hey, well, you know, more interest in the larger work that's probably more profitable than this smaller project. Well, thanks, Paul. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Ms. Saludo. Yes. Mr. Reiner. Yes. Mr. I'm sorry, Ms. Fox. Yes. yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa. Yes. Mr. Keeler. Yes. Mayor Amrose Grimes. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Okay, resolution 30-21. Acceptance of a preliminary plat for towns on the parkway located within the Bridge Street District. I'll introduce it. Thank you. Uh, we'll go back to Nikki for staff presentation. Welcome back. Let's see if we can make this work tonight. Okay, good evening. Uh, before you is a request for acceptance of a preliminary plat for towns on the parkway. Uh, the site is located within the Bridge Street District and zoned Sawmill Center Neighborhood District, located south of Teller Road and northwest of the intersection with John Shields Parkway and Village Parkway. The proposal is for a subdivision of approximately 11 acres to establish four new lots for development and the dedication of three public rights of way, as well as to establish necessary easements. Planning and Zoning Commission has recommended approval of the preliminary plat to City Council and staff is recommending acceptance tonight. Okay, great. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Lindsay, have we received any public comment relative to this legislation? I have nothing. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, council questions, discussion? No questions, no discussion? Uh, I, I have just a couple items in reading through the um, minutes from the Planning Commission. Uh, you know, there was some talk about these dead end um, private streets essentially in there. And I just wanted to verify that those would in fact be private streets, not public streets. So if they were to come out onto the road network, that would be another um, interaction between a private street and a public street. Is that correct, Mickey? That is correct. Okay. And there was also a lot of discussion on, um, I, I hope I see the applicant is here to see that. I, I uh, would just like to encourage the applicant to listen to the Planning Commission on what they were asking for in terms of, uh, I saw that the approval wasn't uh, given for the roof height uh, continuance and things like that, and hope that they listen to that and really make uh, a good run if they want to be successful at really outstanding buildings and outstanding look. And I think I think the Planning Commission gave really sound advice to the applicants. So, um, that I don't have anything further. And if there's nothing further from Council um, on the preliminary plot, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Yeah. Okay, resolution 21-31. Acceptance of a final plat for Bridge Park East section four block G. Another two set. Great. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. This is a request for acceptance of a final plat. This final plat is for Bridge Park East, uh, lot nine located within the Bridge Park development um, and specifically to facilitate development of Block G. The site um, is located north of Bridge Park Avenue and uh, west of Dale Drive. This plat is the combination of three parcels to establish an approximately 2.3 acre site for development 
as well as to establish public access easements for publicly accessible open spaces. With that, Planning and Zoning Commission is recommending approval and staff is recommending acceptance of the resolution this evening. Be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Nikki. Uh, Lindsay, have we received public comment on this legislation? No, we have not. Uh, council questions, discussion? Yeah, Jane. Yeah, the, the only thing that I would say is I, I think that um, you can feel pretty good about um, the planning and zoning's review of this particular plat and um, the work that they have done with uh, trying to get uh, the building um, footprint and uh, its siding in a way that um, is conducive to the public realm. Um, I um, There's always more improvements we can always ask for, but I, I, I feel, you know, like, like we've really um, done some good work on this plat. So I just wanted to share that with council. Okay. Uh, other comments? Uh, hearing none, Jenny, would you please call roll? Ms. Aludo? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. yes. Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. And Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Um, okay, uh, our next two resolutions I will abstain from, and uh, Vice Mayor DeRosa will. Right, thank you, Mayor. Um, so next is resolution 3221. Accepting the lowest and best bid for the Chamber of Commerce renovation and addition project. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I believe Megan has our staff report this evening. Good evening, members of council. Pursuant to the city's lease with the Dublin Chamber of Commerce for the building located at 129 South High Street, Dublin and the chamber agreed to make certain improvements to the building and site to share the costs of such improvements. Staff and the chamber decided to implement the improvements in two different phases, with the first phase being the improvements to the building itself and the second phase, a gateway pavilion. The first phase improvements to the building were designed in collaboration with the chamber and includes alterations and updates to the chamber suite building or public meeting room, community meeting room with kitchen, compliant public restrooms and renovated and updated building entrance and interior hallway areas. The architect's estimate for this project at the time of bid is $450,500. We did receive four bids with Miles McClellan Construction Company submitting the lowest and best of $471,100 as outlined in the staff report. The bids were competitive and prices are reflective of cost escalations that are impacting the vertical construction industry. The cost of the improvements to the building contemplated by the lease exceeds the budgeted amounts and both the Dublin staff and the chamber will share in the cost overruns attributable to each party pursuant to the lease. The city and chamber's contributions were determined and are outlined in the staff report. It's noteworthy that there were a couple of maintenance items, including relocation of the HVAC unit um, and painting of the exterior. Um, those were added to the bid package at the request of Dublin facilities maintenance staff in order to realize efficiencies, and therefore those costs would be considered outside the scope of the improvements that were outlined in the lease. And those improvement or those maintenance items will be funded as part of facility management's renovations budget. With regard to what is referred to in the lease as the gateway pavilion, the architectural review board provided informal feedback on that improvement. And although the members were supportive of the concept of a public gathering and seating space, they expressed significant concerns and recommended other alternatives be investigated. So based on the ARB's feedback and the cost of the first phase improvements to the building exceeding budget, the chamber and staff agree construction of the pavilion is now unfeasible to build as designed and accordingly staff is presenting resolution 33-21 authorizing a lease amendment removing the pavilion from the list of improvements um, that's next on your agenda 
Should council approve that resolution, the city will no longer be responsible for the pavilion and the funding for construction of the pavilion, which was estimated to cost $65,000, would be used to offset Dublin's portion of the cost overruns for the phased one improvements to the building. The chamber has committed to pay for its share of the improvements to the building as specified to the lease. Um, and construction of this project is anticipated to commence in June and the contractor will have 120 days to complete the work. We did secure a right of entry from the adjacent property owner to the north to provide the contractor access to the work and the property owner did grant that right of entry at no cost. Um, staff recommends council approval of resolution 32-21 accepting Miles McClellan's bid as the lowest and best. The improvements in the project will provide for a vibrant, flexible, collaborative environment to accommodate the chamber's operations and better serve members and the Dublin business community. Um, a copy of the layout of the building, as well as some interior inspiration pictures were included in your packet. And joining us this evening from the Chamber of Commerce are Jenny Amrose, the Chief Operating Officer, and Sean Henderson, the Treasurer. Um, they have been great partners in this project, and I'd like to thank them for their work and collaboration. And we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Megan. Um, I thought I would check in with Lindsay to see if we've had any public comment on this tonight. We have not, Vice Mayor. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And with that, um, as Megan said, we're uh, fortunate to have a couple members of the chamber with us this evening. So, Jenny Amros, if you're there, would you like to make a comment or two? I would. Thank you. Um, I just really want to thank both city staff and um, all the council members for their support of this. Um, project and seeing the vision that we have um, to care to move forward in our business community. And it will truly be a wonderful asset. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, members of council, questions or comments for staff? So uh, I have a question. It's really more about the math. I mean, I think this is a fantastic uh, renovation and addition. Um, I'm just having trouble with the math. Um, the original 450 that included the 65,000 for the part that is not going to be done now, correct? The pavilion, correct? It included the pavilion and also the um donation, okay? Um, and so the, the cost for the original cost without the pavilion would have been around 385,000. Is that right? Correct. Um, the so if we take the um we, the city's the city's original estimate for their portion was 270. So if you take 270 and you add 65,000 to it, we're basically agreeing to kick in the dollars for the civilian now to cover the over, overrun cost overrun. Um, I get the 35. So I'm I'm having a hard time getting from three going from 335 to 394, and I'm wondering what that difference is. So I guess to start, you know, the estimates that were provided in the lease are now over a year old, and they were yeah. pre-COVID. Um, sure. So the vertical construction industry has definitely seen increase in costs. So a review of all of the bids, we, we couldn't really identify one specific item that accounted for the increases. It really was spread out across the bids. Um, so I don't know if that helps. Well, I guess, yeah, I, I definitely get it. I think I've heard lumber costs are three times what they were. So another way to say that is 300%. Um, it's significant. So I get the increase. I guess I thought, I, I was confused because I've seen this four hundred and fifty thousand dollar number, but it wasn't really four fifty apples to apples. It was three eighty five. Was the original estimate for the work that we're now planning to ahead with, um, and now it's four seventy one. So that's a very significant increase. But what the the the, the uh, memo says is. That we're kicking in 394 and I'm just having a hard time getting to the 394 
because if I take the um, if I take the uh, 270, which is what the, the city originally budgeted for their portion without the pavilion, and then I add the pavilion in, I get the 335. It's you know uh, it's probably not worth quibbling about. I'm just having a hard time figuring out where this money, why it wasn't accounted for. So the original, the total project cost, as estimated in the lease originally, was four hundred and fifty thousand, and that included the improvements to the building, as well as the pavilion, as well as the furnishings. So that was the total project cost for both the city's contribution and the chamber's contribution. I hope that helps. It's, it's okay. <laughs> Again, the, it, it's, the costs have definitely gone up, and that's okay. why. Good enough. Okay. Thank you. I oh, thought. Well. Can I? Can I? I thought that the chamber was paying. I thought that the original estimate of four fifty, the city's cost was three ninety five, the chamber's cost. Um, no, let's see. I thought the chamber was paying for furnishings, and the balance of the of the. Um, Originally, well, this one is 395. The city cost 76,000 is the chamber's cost and an additional 75,000 from the chamber for the furnishings. So they're chipping in somewhere in the neighborhood of 150,000 dollars. Is that correct? That's what I thought that it was. Correct. That is and correct. They, and they're not going to get the pavilion. Um, That's right. correct. That's correct. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> for me. Uh, the one thing that I would say is I'm very disappointed that the pavilion's not going to get built. Um, I think this is the gateway to the southern part of the district. I think if we intend to, especially with Dora, if we intend to move um, retail encouragement into South High Street, if we really intend to um, recruit, for some uh, interesting stuff that that needs to bring uh, traffic down there, that we need this we need this pavilion. So I would um, I would encourage council is if you're taking it out of the lease this time that we really revisit this when it comes to um, our capital expenses in the next budget because I, I believe that this is a really important thing. the uh, The architecture review board as well as the historic district task force did recommend something like this at the south end of the district. The ARB was encouraged about um, seeing some sort of pavilion. They, they weren't particularly excited about the design, felt that it was a little bit too overwhelming for the front. That doesn't mean that there can't be a really good design, a better design, one that they would find to be more attractive. So with Dora and with the fact that this is a beautiful package and I do believe that the business community and many people will walk down and use it, I'm requesting that we ask staff to um, think about including this in the in the fall budget um, so that we can bring this forward. Um, but I know the chamber really needs to get this going. I don't want to stop them. I want to get this happening for them, but I definitely think we need this gateway pavilion piece. So that's my pitch and I'm yeah, I'll with... second that I, I agree. I thought it was I thought it was beautiful myself. Um, maybe now isn't necessarily the best time to be building anything. Um, so if we can drag our feet, come up with a regroup and come up with a better design that ARB can get behind, I'm all for it. Other comments, thoughts on this? Well, I will echo that it's a lovely design, and um, as we look at that redesign, even more of the space looks like it's going to public use in that in, in the building. So I, I think that's phenomenal. Having listened to Scott's conversation earlier about the future of work, these types of spaces are going to be in significant demand. So um, it really is incredibly unfortunate that we've seen this price increase have to put us in a position to to make some choices here, but um, we're seeing that all around. We saw that in the guardrail this evening. We're seeing that kind of everywhere. So it's wonderful to get an opportunity to begin this work. And um, then as we re look at our CIP moving forward, have an opportunity to, I, I agree. I think there's some um, opportunities to do that pavilion at a future point. So um, any other comments or thoughts? 
If not, Jenny, could you please call roll? Ms. Fox? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. And Ms. Aluto? Yes. Thank you. Resolution 33-21. Authorizing the city manager to enter into a first amendment of the lease agreement between the city of Dublin and the Dublin Chamber of Commerce. I'll introduce it. Thank you very much, Christina. Megan? Good evening, members of council. As was mentioned in the introduction to resolution 32-21, pursuant to the city's lease with the Dublin Chamber of Commerce for the building located at 129 South High Street, Dublin and the Chamber agreed to make certain improvements to the building and site and to share the costs of such improvements. The architectural review board reviewed and provided informal feedback on the improvement that was referred to in the lease as the downtown gateway pavilion at their August 26 meeting. And although the members were supportive of the creation of a public gathering and seating space that was open to the public, they did express concerns that the proposed structure and its design overwhelmed the existing building and dominated the street frontage. They also expressed concerns about the increase in lot coverage with the proposal and recommended the applicant um, investigate other alternatives to meet the requirements. So based on the ARB's feedback and the costs of the other improvements to the building coming in higher than expected, the chamber and staff agree construction of the pavilion is now unfeasible to build as it's currently designed. And accordingly, staff and the chamber have agreed to amend the lease, removing the pavilion from the list of improvements in both exhibits B and C to the lease. Should council approve this resolution, then the city will no longer be responsible for the pavilion and we will use that funding that was identified for construction toward offsetting Dublin's portion of the cost overruns for phase one improvements to the building. The balance of the lease remains unchanged. Um, once again, I would like to thank the chamber for their work and collaboration on the improvements and on this lease amendment and staff recommends council approval of resolution 33-21 authorizing the city manager to enter into a first amendment of the lease agreement between the city and the Dublin Chamber of Commerce. And I'd be happy to answer any further questions you may have. Great, thank you very much, Megan. Lindsay, I'll check in to see if we've had any public comment. We have not. Thank you. Questions, comments? Seeing none, I, I would like to again thank our partners at the Chamber. I think this is a wonderful project. And we're very excited to be able to partner with you on this and bring some new amenities to our business community and the residents. And uh, as we said earlier, hopefully we'll be able to circle back around and, and complete the project um, at some point in the future. Um, thank you very much for your partnership. With that, Jenny, could you just call roll? Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. And Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Okay. Um, this brings us to resolution 34 21. Temporarily permitting outdoor dining and eating areas beyond previously approved locations, temporarily permitting portable non residential structures, and temporarily permitting certain signs. I want to do so. Thank you, Christina. And uh, General is going to be uh, present our staff report this evening. Welcome, Dana. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, members of council. As you know, as part of my authority, when I declared a state of emergency relative to COVID-19, I enacted several executive orders that permitted the following. First, outdoor dining and eating areas beyond previously approved locations. Second, portable non-residential structures. Third, window signs greater than 10% square footage of all windows and temporary signs in front of businesses. These temporary permits automatically expire when I end the state of emergency, and I will very likely lift that state of emergency in the near future, assuming the governor will be lifting his relative to the pandemic. So once lifted, the temporary permits I authorize will no longer be in effect. So I do believe the lifting of public health restrictions guidelines is occurring sooner than expected, which by the way is a great thing. I think we would all agree. However, I do I believe that our restaurants and others still need some time to recover and or make up 
for losses experienced during the pandemic. Also, transitioning to normal will take time as well, as I'm sure you could imagine. So we really have three outdoor dining scenarios that remain where we have issued temporary permits. The first one is Bridge Park, representing several restaurants, namely the Avenue, Frank and Carl's, Rebel, Z Kachina, Hencorder, Urban Myers Pine House, Cap City, and Fado. As you know, these have been predominantly in the street on longshore or expanded uh, sidewalk seating. Uh, secondly, there's Tucci's in Historic Dublin, who's normally issued a permit for outdoor dining. Uh, generally this time of year through October 1st anyway. Um, and they also have some seating uh, along the south side of the restaurant. Napa and Katzinger's, uh, in Napa's case, I just want to take a moment to thank Tim Rollins, the owner, for his cooperation in trying to mitigate noise to the residents and only using a portion of the outdoor space he might have otherwise been able to use. Um, as much or more so, I want to also thank the immediate residential neighbors to Napa who have been most patient and understanding during this period. These residents and neighbors have expressed that they did experience unwanted noise from the patio during this period, but they were certainly willing and understanding of the situation at hand and allowed that to continue. At the same time, they have, a, they have stated that they are willing to work with Napa to see if their concerns can be mitigated should more time be permitted for Napa to have a temporary uh, patio use. Uh, Coast Wines on South High Street had some temporary permit as well, although they have they are not using it so much now. They had some temporary seating in their lawn, but they, they are not using it anymore. They're really relying on their existing patio. And then a fifth item is St. Bridges, who had some outdoor facilities, classrooms, uh, that gave them some um, temporary expansion space. So resolution 3421 is being brought before council this evening for your consideration in advance again of the lifting of the state of emergency should that happen. The key question is, should the city continue to grant temporary permits for these situations for what staff proposes to be to October 31st, 2021 or some other time that would be council's pleasure. Obviously, we're proposing uh, this to allow some additional runway for recovery and transition. Uh, we will only do this if noise concerns can be reasonably addressed. So hopefully, you know, we can come to uh, to an agreement and address any issues that may exist between neighbors and and any adjacent restaurants, if that be the case. So I, I want to thank you uh, for your consideration of this question. And, I'll, and by the way, I'll ask Jennifer Radler, our law director, if she has any cleanup she wants to do based on my comments, in case there's something I missed. So Jennifer, do you have anything you want to add? Perfect. Nothing to add. Okay. I, I won't get that very often, so I'll thank her for that one. So. <laughs> Uh, I had a little hand in drafting it. Oh, she did. She helped <laughs> me out, coached me through. So we'll we'll try to uh, answer any questions between uh, Jennifer and I if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lindsay. Have we received any public comment relative to this legislation? We have not. That. Council questions, discussion. Uh, Andy. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Andy. Uh, Okay, I, I was just going to say, I think I've said before, I'd really like to see parts of uh, Bridge Park shut down permanently and, uh, you know, um, raise the, the road bed up, put some pavers in and um, planters and that kind of thing, make it a little bit more walkable. I know it's a challenge in, in parts where the park, there's a parking garage and you got to get the garbage trucks in and out, but I'd really like to explore that option um, with the city and Crawford Hoying if there's um, interest in that. Yeah, I agree with you, Andy. I think it's really important to have a pedestrian walkable city down there. I think uh, those improvements will help everybody out. I think just make the whole ambiance a lot more enjoyable for everyone. So I think this is a great thing, Dana, and I think it's something we should do and not I don't know if it needs a lot of discussion or not. I, th I think it's well put together and it's something important, not only for the citizens, but for the businesses down there. Yeah, Jane. You know, I, it brings up a really interesting conversation too. I don't disagree. I, I, I think that the pandemic has shown us how much fun street side dining can be and these pedestrian ways that were created out of, out of a need have turned out to be a real fun amenity. Um, 
I think that we have to ask ourselves a question as is our code one that we should be looking at ways to create spaces that allow us to have more creative outdoor dining. Like we're talking about the Derby lot. Now we're going to be using it around the Irish festival for all sorts of things. So, you know, I think it's worth a little, um, um, you know, maybe conversations and study to sit down and take a look at how we can be a little bit more creative with our streetscape and allowing some of these, you know, interesting dining options or place making amenities or whatever, and, and not so restrictive. And then um, I also wonder um, whether or not going into the winter, we've talked about like a winter festival, whether or not taking the opportunity down in Bridge Park where we've closed off the street in the summer, maybe that's an opportunity to try it out at, with a winter festival down there, just to kind of see what it would be like to have this pedestrian byway, um, you know, in the middle of Bridge Park. But but I, I'd like to pursue the conversation because I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Yeah, Kathy. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah, Jane, I, I think there's lots of interesting opportunity and I think folks have really enjoyed it. Um, I just wanted to um, make a couple of comments um, and Dana had referred to the situation at Napa. I think everybody has enjoyed um, having outdoor dining. There, there are residents and I, I can tell you that they have reached out to me um, about uh, noise control and issues, ongoing issues. For those folks that are listening that aren't familiar with Napa, there's uh, houses directly behind Napa. Napa and or the, actually that development was built after those homes were built. So many of these residents did not opt into this situation. It sort of opted itself onto them and they continue to have issues. And I so appreciate Dana, um, your reaching out to the owners. I think the residents um, are also a, a appreciative of having outdoor dining and want to find resolu a resolution to that. But I, I, it's very important that I share with council and I told the residents that I would that if the noise continues, that th that that is not a, an, an option. They have been very patient and, and very understanding, but have have consistently um, without exception, those directly behind shared that that the noise is still loud. So I thank you, Dana, for reaching out and, and finding a, a, a resolution. But I just want to, you know, share with council and get some feedback that if that is not in that one particular situation remedied, that there is a way in this particular resolution to to say that that's not an acceptable situation. So again, let's hope uh, a really good positive resolution happens. But if it doesn't, this res this the way this is written, um, I believe if I understand and I'm looking at Jennifer and she's nodding her head, allows the city manager the the ability to to say we're, we haven't reached satisfaction here. Yes, that's correct. If I may, Mayor, I, Vice Mayor Rosa, thanks. I want to thank you for reaching out as well to those residents. We knew going into this situation that that was particularly sensitive and the residents, you know, cooperated in a great way, which, you know, I, I will reiterate that yet again and how much we appreciated that. And uh, in my conversation with Tim Rollins is very interested in trying to find a way that they he can continue during this runway if you allow it. I'm calling it. It's not a permanent arrangement. None of these will be. It's just to, you know, as we've said, try to extend a little bit and then give time for, as you all suggested, for some more discussion about what might could be some permanent solutions and or invite people to come forward and try to resolve those or create opportunities and uh, maybe go through a process to consider more permanent situations. So it's a good bridging solution potentially, but I commit that I will work with the residents and Mr. Rollins as well to try to find a meaningful solution there. Thank you. Dana. Dana. Oh, Kathy, or can I just ask the question of Dana or and you or you, Kathy? Um, is this a noise problem from music or just from conversation, outdoor dining conversation? Dana, you're muted. Get the wrong. I thought it was unmuted. Um, I, 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 and Vice Mayor DeRose can speak to it as much as I can, but our, our understanding, if you let me, Vice Mayor DeRose, is that it's really been more about voices as much as anything. I don't even think he's had live music out there. It's been voices later in the evening, which tend to carry more, and people kind of get happier when the evening moves on to and a little bit louder. Uh, 
but uh, which can be a good thing, but uh, it's not such a good thing if you have to listen to it. So uh, we're, we're very tuned into that situation and try to work through some mitigative type um, actions to see if we can't figure a way to, to soften that. And again, for a temporary time frame. That is my understanding as well, Jane. Thank you. It helps to understand where the noise is coming from. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I would, I really agree with Andy and Jane about, um, you know, having um, opportunity for outdoor dining, particularly in Bridge Park. I think that really planning commission ought to look at what, what was originally contemplated. There was significantly wider sidewalks than are what, what is there at present so that we wouldn't have to close really expensive roads in order to provide that. You know, our code types of uses our code really should be property there also. I appreciate those comments. You're cutting out, Chris. I, maybe you could repeat the last part. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying, I think it's important to go back to what was originally contemplated there. And that, that is significantly wider sidewalks that would allow for, um, you know, alfresco kind of dining uh, and also yet provide a, an urban walkable district as well. So that these um, these entities can accommodate both of those on on the development, the property that they're doing. So we don't need to require we won't wouldn't be required to close really expensive roads to um, to have that ability at this point in time. So I, I think probably a look at code is is important on that as well. Uh, any other comments, discussion from council? No, hearing none. Uh, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mayor M. Rose Grooms? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, General. Okay, other business. Uh, we have our Beautify Your Neighborhood grants, and uh, Jenny Roush will have our staff report. Can, can you hear me? Am I still breaking out? We can hear you. Okay. Um, maybe, uh, Jenny might be having some technical difficulties. Maybe we will go ahead and skip to the Dora extension of hours and we'll come back to Jenny. Um, so we have an extension of hours request for the Dora and Allison. There she is, and she will be giving her staff report. I think Jenny was just waiting because this is a good transition from the last topic <laughs> that we just had. So good evening, members of council. Um, as many of you know that we are planning um, on doing Dublin Irish days instead of a typical normal Irish festival. Um, and a big part of that is bringing a lot of the things we did over at the Irish festival into downtown Dublin. Um, we have confirmed now we're going to have 30 of our vendors set up in the Derby lot throughout the weekend. We're working with visit Dublin Scott and his staff to do um, have some bands in some of the bars and restaurants. We're having hotel packages. We're going to have pop up entertainment throughout the weekend. So we just want to make sure that the entire downtown area is full of music and fun. And we've, you know, we've talked to our other partners down there and we think in the long run, this might really be kind of the. Almost like a playbook for any other big events that would want to take over and do stuff throughout the area. So, because this is the first time we're doing something like this, connecting both sides of the river, we're asking to extend the Dora hours. This is the first um, request for the extension of the Dora hours. At this point, I think it might be the only one during our Dora pilot program. I've not received any other request um, from now through August, um, but something could pop up, although we asked for 60 days notice. Um, so, and we, it's something that council can do just as a vote on their own. We don't need to go back to the state to change hours specifically. So it's just a simple vote of council. So the days that we're looking at, um, 
the the dub crawl. We're calling we're calling the whole weekend the dub crawl instead of just the Thursday night. So um, Thursday night would be the same um, hours that dorm normally is from five to ten. On Friday, we're asking to extend it just a couple hours to midnight. On Saturday, we want to take advantage of the whole day. We think this might be a test, so we um, put in 9 a.m. because that's when the farmer's market starts, and so we thought that might be a white, nice way to test that out. And then on Sunday, we are proposing from noon to 8 p.m., and I can answer any questions you might have. Great. Thank you, Allison. Lindsay, I want to check in with you to see if we've received any public comment relative to this legislation. We have not. Great. Thank you. Uh, council questions and discussion. The only question I would have, Chris, is, and, and I'm sure I'm going to get a, a, a zero response on this, is were there any, Allison, did you have any uh, documented complaints through the police department through anything about the door this past week? I'll actually ask Lindsay to come back up. She did a little research this morning. I heard all the positive things. I know she was checking in with police and others to see if they received any comments on their end. I'm surprising Lindsay. She's probably <laughs> oh, there's she. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. Just had to turn on my camera and unmute, and I'm now I'm ready to go. Uh, yes, we did follow up with all of the key stakeholders this morning. Uh, you heard from Scott Dring earlier today, who um, uh, touched base with all of the businesses who had basically glowing reviews. Um, we also checked with police who had no um, concerns or incidents that they reported for the first weekend. Obviously, they were monitoring that closely. And we do um, have a QR code and a link up to receive feedback from people that we were promoting throughout the weekend. And we received three comments through that. Two were positive, very positive. And then the third was just from a resident at Bridge Park who didn't, uh, it was before the door even happened and just said that they're, they were concerned about noise. Um, but other than that, uh, we received positive comments after this weekend. Thanks, Lindy. I think that's important as we decide whether or not we're going to extend hours. We should know how it worked out the first week. Okay, absolutely. Thanks. Yep. And we are monitoring closely. So Great. thanks for asking. Uh huh. Hey, other comments yet, yeah, Kathy? Oh, sorry. Uh I, I have a question first and then a comment. Um, Allison, um, when do the events end on Saturday night, the city activity events? We're, we're extending this to midnight. Does that mean you can buy alcohol up until midnight or the event? I'm just trying to understand the parameters. Yeah, the way we set, set the rules with the businesses. So on a normal night, if it ends at 10, we tell them that they should serve their last drink by 930. Um, Mainly because we said that you don't have a lot of time then to do anything with it. If you if, if you serve it at 10, you can't even take it outside. Um, so we are planning on having some of the um, restaurants and bars will have bands that late. Our shopping area will not last that late. But one of the things we're looking at is a small stage over on the Bridge Park side, we actually want to do um, outdoor movies after the sun goes down. Um, so we're looking at maybe doing some different movies, um, Irish movies outside at night, and it would be more for an adult crowd. So we're looking at things like the, the, the quiet man and, and, you know, things that adults would enjoy, not necessarily kid movies. So that should go later in the evening. So under the way this would be written, we would say the, the last service is at 1130. Is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, and then my only other comment is on, on the Sunday. Um, I'm just curious what time those events begin. I mean, does one o'clock, I'm just thinking about, we have a church in the, in the proximity I know, and thank you um, staff has reached out to the, to the pastor to make sure they understand if one o'clock in the afternoon might not be a more uh, reasonable time to start that on a Sunday, just given the proximity to uh, service areas, et cetera. Thanks. 
we are starting the vendors at noon because one of the things we wanted to do is capture some of those people who went to the services that um over at the church we wanted them to be able to come um, from whatever the service after they were done to come over and do some shopping um and we also right now we have some music planned in the bry high square i think Actually, that specific group is a harpist um, at noon on Sunday. So we do have some things planned for noon, but certainly if we wanted to start a little later, it probably wouldn't have a huge impact. I think that would make sense personally. I don't know what my colleagues feel about that. I would be supportive of a noon start on Sunday. You know, noon seems a little bit early to be walking around with a drink in your hand on a, on a Sunday almost morning. So I, I would be supportive of a, of a one o'clock start on Sunday. I'm good with that as well. One one other, I don't know if this is the time to talk about it, but we're going to reevaluate the the Dora concept, uh, at least in the fall, if not in the uh, kind of um, halftime. Um, I, I I'm I'm starting to think about the criteria we would use to evaluate this thing and whether it's a success, a failure, you know, what, what are the inputs or metrics? Um, to me, police reports are important, but I'm just thinking out loud here, using 2020 probably isn't a fair baseline because um, nobody was doing anything in 2020. So, you know, going back as far as possible, I'm just throwing that out there. It's just been kind of, top of my head, um, you know, uh, why is uh, drunk and disorderly, whatever, you know, we have to establish what is an acceptable increase. If there is an increase over 2018 or 2019, is it one event, you know, one, one uh, uh, outlier, or is it a certain percentage? Just throwing that out there. Yeah, we do plan on having a preliminary report. I, I believe, I think we're going to target, um, the last meeting in June for a halfway report, even though it won't quite be halfway, uh, but since there's not an early July, and then we'll be back in August and police are already um, gathering those baseline information. Even if we go back, we were saying we still only, you know, if we go back two years, then we have half the number of bars and restaurants that we had probably, you know, so th unfortunately the way things work out, it's gonna be hard to compare to any year because there's not gonna be a true normal year with the same number of retailers. So it'll be interesting to see what the numbers come out as. Allison, can I also suggest that, you know, one of the one of the criteria for your review would be whether or not there's um, a real big increase in litter throughout the district. I think that's also an important factor. I mean, we may not get complaints, but we might get trash on the streets or people dumping things where they shouldn't or whatever. And 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 that's sort of a negative. It's mediate, mediate. You can mediate that, obviously. But I'd like to know whether, you know, what are some of the, we know the positive effects. Let's let's see if we have any real negative effects. Hopefully we won't. But yeah. I, I, along with the others, believe that the one o'clock on Sunday is better because I think church is 11, I think they have an 11 o'clock service, although they don't list it on their site right now. <laughs> And even though you can still capture it for shopping, but I but I do think probably one o'clock is better for allowing alcohol. Okay. All right. You know, I did stop down there Thursday evening. Uh, it was relatively early. Well, not so much maybe for a Thursday. It was eight eight thirty, and uh, you know, I didn't see anyone walking around with a Dora cup. You know, granted, I was I was only there for a half hour, 40 minutes, um, but I would not, and it was a beautiful evening. I would say that I did not see a significant increase in people outside on Thursday. Now, Saturday and Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday may have been a different story, but on Thursday, uh, there was not a whole lot of activity. I would say Friday, good, good. Friday was a, a little bit more. We went um, to dinner down there on Friday evening. Um, and I, I saw several people walking around with door cups, but it wasn't like it was some big free for all. Um, and I don't think it was necessarily any more than uh, on other weekends that I've been down there. Um, and everybody was smiling and happy and it was really nice actually. Beautiful weekend for sure. It was, yeah. Okay, uh, then Christina, was that you making a motion? Yes, yes it was. 
And is there a second? Second. Uh, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Ms. Aludo? Yes. Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. yes. Mayor Amrose Room? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. yes. Okay, Allison, while we have you, we'll stick with you um, for the alcohol sales. In, in the vein of talking about alcohol, we'll talk about alcohol sales at the 2021 Irish Festival. Well, this is the one that I normally come to you every year with just to ask for permission to serve alcohol in Kaufman Park. Obviously, we expect um, a far different number than we normally would have, but we will be selling alcohol in two different places during that weekend. We'll be doing it both at the theater show that we're presenting, which the um, show itself actually takes place in a pub. So we'll have a small bar there where people can have a drink and get one before the show. We don't expect a ton of sales there because there's not an intermission. Um, so we know that'll be a limited um, service there. But then for our concerts down on the south side, we will, um, we're working with our beverage sponsors and we actually met uh, with Lieutenant Tabernacle today to talk about the security needs down there. Um, so it will not in any way look like, you know, a full Irish festival down there, but we're hoping to have around 7,000 people each night. And um, so we will have police and security on site for that as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Lindsay, have we received any public comment relative to this topic? We have not. Council questions, discussion? Uh, hearing none, I, I'm sorry, was there one? No, no, go ahead. I would make a motion to approve. Okay, John makes a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Mr. Keeler? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mayor Ambrose Room? Yes. yes. Ms. Fox. Yes. Okay. Well, we have Homer is already here, so we'll Jenny. We'll, we'll get back to you, Jenny. Hang tight. We're not, I haven't forgotten about you, uh, but we'll go ahead with the ethics and DEI training for members of city council boards and commissions and our staff report with Homer. Okay. Again, good evening, members of council. Currently, uh, all permanent city employees are required to take three mandatory training classes in 2021. And these consist of the following a 1 hour block of ethics training, Ohio ethics training delivered online. Uh, 50 minutes of understanding diversity, equity and inclusion, which is also delivered online. And that training is broken into 9 smaller micro training modules as part of that 50 minute. Um, uh, menu, <clears throat> and then finally, 2 hours of managing implicit bias and racism, which is delivered by Mr. Steve Francis of franchise at DNI solutions. During the May 4th administrative committee meeting, uh, this training was discussed and the committee approved the approval to advance to council uh, a requirement for all members of council boards and commissions to undergo the same training with 1 modification. The 2 hour live managing implicit bias and racism session would be scaled back to 1 hour. Uh, there is no cost uh, for the 2 online sessions as they exist in our current on train online training platform, which is cornerstone. Um, there is a cost, however, for the live sessions, which is uh, $1,250 per session, and we project 3 to 4 sessions being required for all to complete the training. Uh, with the administrative committee's uh, approval to advance to council, staff recommends this training be required for all council boards and commission members uh, with the 2 online training sessions being required to be completed within 60 days of assignment and cornerstone. And staff would coordinate the live sessions for each member to be uh, uh, to register with the completion required by the end of 2021. Uh, any new members would be required to complete the online training within 60 days of being appointed. Uh, finally, it is recommended that this that this training be uh, a biannual training requirement. Subject to your questions, um, again, we recommend approval. And I, I, I'm not sure if Kathy you know has some additional comments. Or not as the chair of the, of the admin committee. Great, thanks, Howard. I'll check in with Lindsay real quick to see if we've had any public comments. We have not. And then open up for council questions and discussion. Kevin. 
Uh, thank you very much, Homer. Um, and as Homer mentioned, the uh, administrative committee discussed a variety of things. I think we were all at, um, universally in agreement. This is a very good thing to do. The challenge, of course, is you know how to make that fit in a very active group's time commitment. You know, where our boards and commissions commit a lot of time. So. I thank the staff for working with Stephen Francis and, and putting together a program that one covers what I think is a, a great program and aligns that with times and needs of the group. So uh, thank you very much for staff's work on that. All right, other comments, questions, council? However, those of us who are on uh, boards at the state of Ohio do take some of these courses on ethics and uh, the other one you mentioned, but I don't know if, you yeah, uh, ours are ours are going to be uh, a variant of what the state already makes you take or should take. Uh, yeah, actually, the one hour um, ethics training is the state training. We just right. use their platform and pull it into Cornerstone and require it. So if you've got credit for it already, I'm sure we could, you know, look at, um, you know, getting that just as long as we get the information. All right, uh, thank I don't, you. I don't see a problem with that personally as long as we can just document it. Okay. Other questions, comments from council? Okay. Um, is there a motion to accept the recommendations of the admin committee? So moved. And a second. A second. Okay. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Jenny, would you call the roll? Mr. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mayor Amrose Grimm? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. And Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Homer. All right, let's go back to uh, Jenny Rouse. We she's resolved her technical difficulties and uh, her staff report on the Beautify Your Neighborhood grants. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Can everyone hear me? Thank you. My apologies. I was waited this whole time and then my internet failed me, so I apologize. Um, so as was included in your packet, we had five applications for the Beautify Your Neighborhood grant um, for this year's funding and the Community Development Committee uh, reviewed all of those at their April 27th, uh, 2021 meeting. Um, the neighborhoods that were included in this application round were Bishop's Crossing, Riverside Woods, uh, Savona, Terraza, and Wyandotte Woods. Um, the total grant request of these five applications combined was $23,244 out of a total of uh, $32,000 available. So um, we were able to use a majority of the money within that. And the Community Development Committee recommended approval of all these re grant application requests. So with that, we are requesting council's approval this evening. Thanks, Jenny. I wanna check in with Lindsay if we received any public comment relative to this business. We have not, Mayor. Thank you, ma'am. Council questions, discussion? Yeah, I just want to thank all the uh, community leaders who put forth the effort to uh, beautify their neighborhoods. Uh, um, I know it's uh, sort of a hassle to go through all the paperwork and the bids and the forms, but they all did it. And uh, just thank you to everybody who uh, participated in this from around Dublin to make our community a prettier place. So, and thank you, the uh, community me me uh, members, Chris and uh, Andy. Jenny, I assume we'll have a second round, being that there are fund, there is funding, uh, there is residual funding available. Yeah, we can look and see um, with the total amount. Yeah, if there's any other neighborhoods out there that would want to submit and use the rest of those funds. Great. Appreciate it. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Any comments? No. Uh, I'll make a motion to accept the community development committee recommendations regarding approval of the beautify your neighborhood grants. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, John. Uh, Jenny, would you please call the roll? Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, we'll go back to Allison for the uh, DCRC Talus waiver or FICE. 
Yeah, it's actually um, so the, the Columbus Fesh, um, it started in Columbus. I think it's now 36 years ago and in their early years, they moved up um, to what was Dublin High School. And I think many of you know that the Irish Festival started as the after party to the Fesh and it's just re really kind of grown from there. They have been at the school um, since 1988, so they've been at, at Kaufman High School for many years. Um, but unfortunately, I think a lot due to the fact that schools seems to keep starting earlier and earlier, um, schools ask that they not use their site anymore. So we are still looking for a site for the future, but this year, because the Irish Festival doesn't need the rec center, um, they have looked at the rec center and the rec center will fit their needs for this year. Um, so we don't exactly know all the rooms exactly yet, but we estimate the range to be anywhere from three to 5,000. It's probably gonna be closer to the lower end of that. Um, in the past, they have paid the schools, but the city has also paid $4,000 to enhance the air conditioning um, at the schools. It was a, a bed tax request many years ago, and instead it was put into um, community events budget. Uh, so most of those families that do come for the Columbus Fesh, they're usually at about um, 800 to 1,000 um, competitors. Do stay in our Dublin hotels. Uh, they work with Visit Dublin to get different packages and um, are there at the various hotels. Uh, so they did make a request to see if they could get some reduced or waived funding for this year's event. Being that it is um, you know, coming after year, they had to cancel last year and they're really not sure exactly where they're going to be in the future and they don't exactly know how many people they might get this year. So that was the request and um, I can answer any questions about that. Great, thanks Allison. Uh, Lindsay, have we received any public comment relative to this topic? No, ma'am. Uh, council questions, discussion? Yeah, I just have a question and, and maybe I missed it on here. Are they going to be using that during the time that the Irish festival is what well, we're having a little Irish festival? It will be at, at the same time. It, they actually, they, because we will start on Saturday at four o'clock. That's usually about when they're wrapping up. So there will be a little bit of an overlap on Saturday. Um, Friday night, they just use it for setup. So we're probably thinking there might be an hour or so um, overlap of the nighttime concerts, but that would be it. Well, I don't think there's a problem with the overlap. In looking, I wasn't as familiar with what they do, but their competitions, everything is Irish oriented. They're dancing, their arts and crafts, yeah. their woodworking, their photography. Is it open to the public? You know, it's funny because normally it is at the high school. They don't get a ton of visitors. They mostly get, you know, grandmas and aunts and uncles and parents. Um, this one, because they're going to have to sort of discourage some extra viewing because there's just not the space. Um, you know, so example, um, back when they were at the high school in the big gym, they would have six stages going at once, but they have the bleachers, so people would sit on the bleachers. Right. And we don't have that same kind of setup. We'll, they'll have three... Um, stages in the community hall, but there's really enough room for the parents and, you know, just the kids that are competing. Yeah, it's really a shame that that couldn't be part of the entertainment for the weekend because it's so wonderful. I, I mean, is that possible that they could do some things outdoors, maybe even in the amphitheater or you have space for that? We did talk about actually what they normally do um, is they have what they call their parade of champions. And so the uh, boys and girls, I, I say that, but a lot of them are, you know, high school kids as well. Um, those that are the winners, they come and represent always at the Irish Festival at the amphitheater. So we're going to ask them again to come and perform at the concerts that night. Just so there's always that little taste of, you know, who, and it's great when you see that parade of champions because you see the littlest ones and then you see, you know, the I seniors in high school. Yeah, I think that's a, that would be a joy to share with the community. So the best way you could. So yeah, absolutely, I think that's wonderful that they're going to be there, located there. All right, thanks, Allison. Mm -hmm. Others? Okay, hearing now, make a motion to waive the rental fees for the VCRC talents. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. I'll second. Thanks, Jane and Andy. Uh, Jenny Woods Coral. Mr. Reiner. Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mayor Amrose Rooms? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. And Mr. Peterson? 
Yeah. Okay, that brings us to staff comments. Uh, I think Dana might have a few items for us, perhaps. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Good evening again. I have a few. Yes. Uh, the first one is I sent a memo to council last week and we have posted it for public view regarding changes to events, camps, pools, and the rec center based on changes, um, lifting restrictions and guidelines relative to COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, many of those have been covered tonight with uh, Allison's comments and the Irish festival. However, uh, just real quick, I'll highlight a few things. Um, Independence Day, we do plan to go back to a uh, in person parade on the traditional route. There'll be some limitations relative to handout of candy and brochures and things like that. Uh, limiting touch points, if you will. Uh, we are making necessary adjustments to take um, our, our concert back into Kaufman Stadium as one concert as opposed to two separate venues. Um, as you can imagine, we have not been able to secure what we would consider a national act, but we have secured several local bands, some pretty popular ones. So I think we'll still have a have a great time. We will still do what we will do our traditional fireworks show following that. So it's a significant return to normal. Uh, one of the things we're changing though is the size of tables for renting. We will we will rent uh, 60 inch round tables for eight people instead of the 72 inch round tables for 10. I don't mean rent, but sell the tables uh, for that evening. Uh, sales will be online for the for the most part. So watch for that. I won't go back over the Irish festival. I think you've heard all things that have changed there with the exception of uh, the, the concert venue in the south part of Kaufman Park that Allison referred to. Uh, rather than doing tables there, we're going to do uh, more of an open lawn seating, which will allow many more to attend those concerts. So blankets and chairs and things like that people can bring and then they can buy tickets as well. Changes to the rec, uh, rec recreation programs. Uh, we are really opening up the rec center more so as normal. So you'll see that, although a lot of great lessons learned about online and, and be able to push um, rec programming out, if you will. So we'll continue to, to leverage those kinds of things. So there's lots of information in the memo about that. Out, outdoor pools uh, returning to normal operations, uh, again, starting this weekend, as we traditionally do with Memorial Day weekend and um, no more blocking, if you will, of, or scheduling in blocks. Uh, we'll be opening up as normal. We're doing that a couple days ahead of the June 2nd announcement by the governor, but this is following suit with many other cities in the area as well. So we're consistent with what, what others are doing. And the reason for that is to start one way and then just a couple days later switch to other way of conducting business would just be counterproductive. We'd rather stay closed than do that. So we're going to side on the CDC and the guidance from the state that you know we can we can do this safely and in a way that that protects everyone uh, summer camps uh, we will imp impose certain restrictions and guidelines similar to what remain for schools uh, although what we've heard from our parents uh, wanting to put their kids in camps are actually relieved by that and glad that we are conducting it that way you know until more and more kids can get access to the vaccine and we have a uh, been able while we've closed enrollment, we have been able to accommodate all children on, on all the wait lists, which is exciting to see. So uh, that's that's just sort of the highlights. There's a lot more information in that memo and more, much more specifics. But I think the key thing is we are celebrating getting open again. And, and I just want you and the public to understand that we as staff want to be as open and back to normal as anybody. So we're trying to lean forward on that and push that envelope as much as we can and do that safely. Of course, we still want to promote for pe to people that, um, you know, sanitizing, uh, sanitization procedures as we've been promoting, stay home if you feel sick. Uh, if you've not been vaccinated, maintain social distance and uh, wear a mask if you're not vaccinated. If, even if you are vaccinated, um, you know, we ask that you uh, just be careful when in large crowds. And of course, we want to uh, promote and uh, suggest people do seek vaccination. So that'll be part of what we'll be um, uh, pushing as well. So good news on that front. I hope you agree. Uh, the other thing uh, related to that is the um, uh, internal operations. I, I sent a memo to council today that we'll be sharing with staff starting tomorrow about how we will uh, very much open up our internal operations and open up facilities, other city facilities to the public as well. Also starting on 
May 29th, consistent with these other orders that we're going to follow. So very happy to do that. Um, also sort of consistent with this is the opening of the North Pool, which will happen this weekend. We'll have a, a bit of a, a ribbon cutting on Friday evening and then the pool opening completely on Saturday. So very excited about that. We thank all of our residents in the area for their putting up with any inconvenience during the construction. Also want to thank Dublin City Schools. What an incredible partnership with them because you know that's that North Pool is co-located with Wyandotte Elementary and they have just been champs uh, in putting up with any inconvenience and also helping us to get the pool open. I uh, want to thank Jeff Stark, the facilities operations manager there and uh, John Marshhausen, the new superintendent for all the support on allowing us to access their private hydrant. You wouldn't think that's a big deal, but it's a big deal when you're trying to build fill a bunch of big pools. So uh, that really helped us out. So all things seem to be systems go for next weekend, this weekend rather, and we hope that sticks. One other quick announcement is River Crossing Park. You may have noticed by now that we'll have a memo, I think in your city manager update packet tomorrow, talking about how we're gradually opening up uh, River Crossing Park. Uh, we did open up the public restrooms on the plaza uh, to help with Dora actually over the weekend. So I heard that was uh, welcome. <laughs> And uh, there's other information in that memo about how we will gradually open up other components of the park throughout the rest of the year as those venues become available. And then into next spring as lawn gets established and we're able to get the whole park open. So a good plan, I think there, things running on time as we had hoped. So that's all the great news. I think a lot of good stuff and uh, very hopeful for a good summer coming up and, uh, and going on the rest of the year. So other, unless you have any other questions or comments, that's, that's all I have. Questions for Dana? Thanks, I, I know I have received a lot of questions about the fireworks. That seems to be the, uh, that seems to be the sacred ground that people are, are wanting to make sure happens. So, um, thanks for staff. I know there's a lot of work to, to switch gears as it were on, on a lot of those things and sure do appreciate their efforts. Okay, um, is Je Jenny uh, Delgado sent out a memo all or an email to you all today relative to how we'll go to council reports and liaison reports moving forward to help streamline these um, this time. So welcome feedback, but we're going to give it a shot tonight and, and get through these. Um, so we're going to hear committee reports and we'll start with the admin committee. Uh, and these will be done, I believe, in the second meeting of each month. Go ahead, Kath. Great, thank you very much. I just have one thing for the admin committee. Um, as folks may know, the admin committee is responsible for working with our boards and commissions. And so I wanted to take a moment tonight to express our deepest sympathies to the Gasson family. We lost one terrific member of our CSAC group, Mr. Gary Gasson, um, recently. Um, and, and he is just an, an incredible uh, supporter, volunteer to the community, and he will be greatly missed. And we just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, send our regards and sympathies to the family. So that's all I have tonight. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, community Development Committee, John. See you all tomorrow yeah. night at yeah. six o'clock. Peter. Right, thanks, John. Uh, Finance Committee, Christina. We have a meeting tomorrow. And Public Services, Jane. I don't have anything to report. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to liaison reports. Um, Jane, for Planning and Zoning Commission, Dublin Bridges in Washington Township. Okay, um, just quickly, the Planning and Zoning Committee did an informal review of 102 uh, square foot, uh, I mean, square foot single family development at the um, corner of Post Road and Highland Croy. I think you're familiar with that. That was the one that came before us before. Um, and it gave uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission gave it generally supportive, supportive of the layout and of a single family development, but there is a historic farmstead there that is considered um, uh, to be preserved through a cultural assessment, uh, historic cultural assessment. So staff is looking into further looking at recommendations on its preservation. Um, 
Another one was an acceptance of a final development plan for all, all our friends adult care facility at the corner of Parkwood and Emerald Parkway. And as reported earlier tonight, PNZ um, reviewed the towns on the Parkway final development plan, which has been a 14 month review by planning and zoning. And um, they felt very good about, um, as you mentioned, Chris, when you spoke to um, the applicant, um, they did listen to many of the suggestions that Planning and Zoning Commission made, which were numerous over the 14 months, and the final product is um, well done. So um, that's pretty much the Planning and Zoning quick overview. Everything on bridges and township? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, bridges um, is, Sending out the gift cards for grads for those uh, seniors to honor those seniors who may be most in need and not receiving something. Um, you can always donate to that. And then the second thing they're asking for donations. They're doing the snacks for students again, beginning June 4th through July, which is a week's worth of snacks. That they hand out every Friday for those who receive free school lunches and breakfasts. So donations are um, being requested on their website, which is neighborhoodbridges.org. In Washington Township, um, they had a cooperative vaccination event on May 18th between the city um, and Washington Township for township employees and their families. They gave 28 vaccinations. They're testing this so that it's possible that in the future they may do some of the booster vaccinations for the city and the townships. So they were um, really pleased with that event. It went very smoothly. And they are uh, also wanted to report that they are receiving money to rebuild Rings Road through Amlin. They have a $500,000 uh, grant and a million dollar loan, and they will be redoing that Rings Road uh, section through Amlin. And that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, Kathy, 33 corridor. We meet in, in June, thank you. Excuse me, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Andy, Logan Union Champagne and US 33. Nothing to report. Sir, uh, John, do you have anything further on the Arts Council or Veterans Committee? The, uh, the Colonel gave a pretty good report. I just want to uh, make you aware that the, um, the um, memorial, uh, honor roll memorials, what it's called for our World War II uh, veterans is now in place in uh, Veterans Park, if you haven't had a chance to see it. It commemorates uh, all the local uh, men and women who served in World War II. Also, uh, the Purple Heart um, thing is moving forward, and I had heard that the Dublin Bridge would be lit in purple somewhere around July 26th and August 7th to honor those veterans who won the Purple Heart. And since Golf Week is coming up, back over to the Dublin Arts Council, if a great exhibit and well done painting. So if you get a chance, make an appointment, stop in there. Thank you. Great, thanks, John. Uh, Greg, Board of Education. Last day of school is Friday. Other than that's all you need to know. Unless you're a senior, it's tomorrow. So that's very exciting around our house. Uh, okay, and uh, Middle Ohio Regional Planning Commission, I did attend the, uh, the Amtrak presentation at the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Uh, put on last week. Um, so we'll have a lot of discussion about trains, loops, and automobiles. It's not planes. We won't be talking about planes, but trains, loops, and automobiles. And that's a conversation we need to continue. Um, okay, we'll bring us to round screen. I will start in the uh, top center of mine, which is Christina. Thanks. I don't have much. Um... Definitely my condolences to the Gasson family. Um, Gary has been a staple in this community and I have gotten to know Barb very well over the years as well. So my heart goes out to them. Um, otherwise, I hope everybody has a good last week of school. Thank you, Andy. I've got nothing tonight. Sir John. Nothing, thank you. She said Jane. I don't have anything. I'm just really happy we're starting to get back to normal and I thank the staff for getting us there. So looking forward to a good summer. Greg. Nothing to report. Thank you. Kathy. 
Great. I just want to echo Jane's comment. I mean, it was, the, the staff has done a tremendous job throughout the pandemic, and there's a significant amount of work to uh, to go back to normal on certain things, and we appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at that North Pool. Thanks. Uh, I am uh, thrilled that we will only have one more virtual council meeting. Uh, this is, I thank you all for your patience. It's been difficult uh, to operate a meeting sitting here in my office by myself and try to figure out what in the world's going on. So I certainly appreciate your patience, the patience of staff and the community at large. And I want them to know that we have done our best in this space and it has been imperfect as it has been. Uh, it has been our best attempt and we hope that we serve them well in the midst of that process. Uh, I too um, send my heartfelt angst uh, to the Gasson family. And I tell you, Gary, he was always fast with a joke and you didn't know what it was gonna be, but it was gonna be funny. Um, so those jokes will certainly be missed. Uh, just send them, Barb and her son, our, our best wishes for sure. Um, and uh, with that, if there's nothing further for the good of the order, we will stand adjourned. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Maria. Maybe my last night with you all. Good night.